Welcome to the latest in the Yugabyte Europe Tech Roundtable webinar series. Um, we kind of do these two different ways. Sometimes we have a Yugabyte specific topic and sometimes we have a, a wider, more industry focused topic. And this week's is a, a wider topic. We are, we're going to talk about um, dev data ops processes. Uh, it's uh, called the webinar um, between the, the DevOps and the DBA, a, a, a reference to between the devil and the deep blue sea, because in my long career of developing and deploying and DBAing, I've always found, even before Agile became a thing, I've always found that um, there's this kind of friction between developers and uh, specific, particularly production DBAs. Um, but with the arrival of, uh, you know, the explosion of, of agile processes and of rapid and frequent delivery, this has become something that has to be resolved, which has to be worked through. And so I think it's kind of an opportunity for me to update my knowledge, because I, I say a lot of my knowledge comes from doing this sort of stuff in the past. And so I'm I'm going to find out from my panel today exactly how things are done nowadays and hopefully how they're best done. So let me introduce the panel for you. Uh, firstly, uh, I'm going to go to Olivia Servan, who is uh, VP Engineering at Comply Advantage, Olivier, yeah? And uh, Frank Pasho, who is a developer advocate at Yugabyte. And finally, David Walker, who is field CTO EMEA for Yugabyte. And um, ooh, we've only got an hour to talk about what you, seems to me to be an enormous topic. So I'm not going to hang around. I'm going to jump in straight with my first question. I'm going to ask that question of you, Frank. Um, when I talk vaguely, as I have just done, about uh, dev data ops processes, um, you know, what does that mean for you? What are you observing when you're seeing and if you're like in the trenches with uh, with engineering teams in your practice day by day, yeah, I've I've seen that uh, the 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 first thing that I observed that all the bad practices, um, because when when DevOps came, uh, the database was always a part of it because it's more complex, and and then what I've seen especially even before being developer advocate when i was doing consulting so going to 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 customers and in development teams and in operations team uh yeah i've seen for, for the past years a lot of progress in devops but the database was still used as a long time ago where people just uh, uh, deploy everything in the database the 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 source of truth for, for the schema, for, for the, the procedures are in the database and they export it and all the bad practices and nobody having really a, a test database. So, so either testing in production or just, just um, uh, deploying without a lot of tests. So my, my first experience there was to see the, the lack of processes for the, for the, the about the data. So when you say lack of processes for the date, what do you mean like um, unit tests for the database itself, like creating? And yeah, everything that DevOps uh, uh, brought to, 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 to the development and that was not there with, with, first about the communication between developers and DBAs. It's always a fight and uh, developers do not really know how the application runs in production and uh, operations do not really know what is released. So the first thing is about the, the communication between the teams and, and, and then all the processes to, to version the schemas to, uh, to be able to deploy safely. Yeah. So you, what I'm hearing, what it, what it seems to me is you're describing a situation where uh, there isn't a great deal of maturity in a lot of organizations in this still yeah. now. And and yeah, and, and still now, yeah. Just just because okay. it's it's more difficult. 
people think that they can do DevOps as they do with the application, but the database as a state, you need to, uh, uh, unit testing is not so easy. So it's kind of thing that everybody knows that they have to do it, but because it's more difficult, then it takes time. Thanks. Olivia, what, what, what's your view on, on the whole end-to-end -end process? Um, well, I agree with Frank. Yeah. So the thing is, uh, I reckon, you know, and there's nothing new under the sun, especially when it comes to IT. It feels like we're always caught in this permanent loop of let's do something right. And then, oh, on the other side, we are going to do the same thing. It's always the same cycle. You compare what we've done in the back end world. Now it's happening in the front end world. Now, um, uh, the cycle on the data side, we've done it uh, through DevOps to simplify the way we ship software uh, for solving the same issue, exactly the same problem. Uh, but like Frank said, it was easier, so we started there. Now we need to tackle the, the harder bit. Um, there is a lot of immaturity from everyone because uh, we are not fully there in terms of DevOps also. You know, let's be realistic there. So um, we are still figuring things out as we do. Um, but, you know, um, when you ship code, it's easy because it's stateless. When you ship stateful data, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, you've got the decades of practices that needs to be updated. Um, you know, what is that the core of the, the DevOps culture? It's uh, being iterative, being transparent, being automated, being able to test easily, to roll back easily with the goal that uh, your holy grail, if you want, is uh, chaos engineering, where you can really introduce as much issues as you want and then everything works still fine. Um, how do you do this with data? So uh, it's, a, 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 it's a typical problem that uh, we all have uh, in all the companies I've been, we all had to solve the same issue. Um, how do you convert simple things? Like, you know, a simple update on a DB can be problematic. You take an integer that you want to convert into a big integer, a small table and a problem, big table, big problem. Um, so, uh, you know, and how, you, how do you roll back this? So what I found in, in my experience, is uh, that you need to decouple a bit the way you do. Uh, and so instead of uh, having one paradigm where you have one table and one application, you go uh, to a stream-based uh, approach. And so what it means is that you need to stream your data so you can easily apply changes to it. And then when it's in this desired state, then it can go into a table where it becomes static, kind of. Um, and if you do it this way, then it, it becomes really easy, but it requires data governance. It, it requires understanding your data flows. It requires a lot of work in terms of data pipeline. Uh, but uh, again, you know, if we go back to uh, software engineering, a lot of companies pretend to have CICD, but actually they don't really. So um, we know uh, if we are honest uh, and, you know, look at us in, in the mirror, we all have the same issues to fix. So uh, it's very much a work in progress, in my opinion. Yeah, you're nodding oh. enthusiastically there, Frank. <laughs> Yeah, and uh, maybe also in, in DevOps with applications, people immediately see the value of it. They are able to release many times a day if, if they do everything correctly. And with the database, you have a lot of effort to do to, to, to version the schema, the changes, test them. Uh, but then you don't really see the value because you still don't want to change the database schema 10 times a day. No. So, I mean, do you, do you think then there is, because it's a bigger, kind of a more heavyweight thing to do to change the data, you are inevitably, you 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 don't just make a small, like you would in, 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 in the software, you make a small change, simple change, you know, recompile, deploy locally, run all the unit tests, you know, pick out whatever falls over, sort those out, bang, it's it's intrinsically very easy 
But also you, you see the benefit of it because then you yes. release a, a new function for the business. Yeah. Most of yeah. the things we do in the database, we do it for the code. We don't do it for the business. Right. There's, uh, something, there's something I think you, you don't want to ignore, which is um, the fear factor. Um, we are all afraid of causing a major issue when we release something, when we do a change in production. Data, by definition, you know, I mean, it's very easy. If you make a mistake in your uh, testing environment, oh, well, it's okay. Uh, you, you'll have a bunch of angry engineers on your back, but that's okay. Uh, if you do the same mistake on production, God forbid. And so the fear factor is so much bigger that a lot of people just back off. Yeah, it's not just a function that doesn't work. It's, you can co up data and data that is there for four years, yeah. But that you mean, but that's almost like the, that fear factor is 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 kind of like stopping it, stopping you being agile. It's stopping you doing frequent delivery because you are building in this sort of reluctance to change. Well, what took so long for all the companies out there to adopt uh, an agile mindset? Fear factor. Again, it's exactly the same thing. You know, the, uh, when you have something that works ish. Uh, then uh, changing it is taking a chance that I, and you end up with something that costs you a lot and uh, doesn't yield more. So, um, uh, and when it comes to data, a lot of people don't know what data they have. You know, uh, that's why you have legislation like GDPR and all that lot. It's it's a forcing function for companies to learn more about their own data. Um, so uh, you can't develop a proper DevOps approach for data if you don't understand what you have. And so there is that learning curve also, you know. It's interesting what you talk about because I think it's accumulation of trends. Agile is one trend, but also the ease that databases allow things. So it used to be difficult to change things in databases, but as databases become more modern, the structures then there, JSON objects or you know, alter tables or whatever these things make it increasingly easy to make changes. So what you see is two, a change in disciplines, and you've touched on it already, Olivier. Um, you've got the DevOps, who should actually have some element of control because it's easy, it helps go through those things. But the DBA changes from a role which is... Um, doing the grunt work and doing the the day-to-day -day work to a consultative role talking uh, talking and educating and helping these people in the best practices you don't want to release it like that so that we'd lose data you want to do these sorts of things and as we see databases um you know being constructed with infrastructure's code and you know software configured the the day-to-day -day routine that a lot of dbas i i spent a large part of my early career you know, laying out disks on, on, on for Oracle databases, and, you know, tuning it to the last degree to get these things to work. Um, but these things go away. You, know, they, you just press a button and it's deployed. The database itself is deployed. Um, rolling upgrades come along with the database and do these things. These are all great. They take some of the work along. But at the same time, and the forcing factors you mentioned of GDPR and compliance with regulatory regimes and everything else, mean that you've got to have much greater care over it. So the database administrator is now becoming something of a data steward, not perhaps in the business sense of the data steward, but something of a data steward within um, the D DevOps team. And so it, we're, we're seeing a shift in the career patterns of what these people are. Developers do need to have more fast access to making changes with database, but they need people who are acting as limiters, controls, consultants, to uh, stewards, all of these words to help them understand whether they're being GDPR compliant, whether they're doing financial regulations, especially in your case. I mean, you know, the whole nature of your company is compliant advantage. It's compliance. You can't be, um, by definition, you can't be seen not to be compliant if yourselves with these things. And um, so you, you need these groups, and, it, and so it becomes a different skill. And I think that's going to change how people sit in the organisation. Um, DBA is going to be consultative. They're going to be different type of people, deeply technical in the combination of data and how it's used in the organisation. 
So a couple of things I want to pick up on there, David. Firstly, something you said earlier on a moment ago, you kind of implied, you know, this, this sort of consultative role for the DBA with an engineering team to help them make decisions about how and what they they deploy. You're kind of implying that 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 consultation, that advice might run something along the lines of, you know, well, let's do a deployment of just this bit, which will imply that schema change. Then we can roll that through. Then we'll deploy the next feature, which will require, which then builds up rather than trying to deploy them both, because that'll give a much be a much more complex schema update to do in one step. Is that is that what you're saying? Absolutely, but also. Even to plug a single module like that, you have to think about the challenges of, are you going to back up the data before? Uh, Olivier already said, how do you roll back when you're changing from an int to a big it? One of the big challenges, which is so often forgotten, is once you've made a schema change, if you start using that schema and then want to roll back, you've actually got data in the new structure. How do you, how do you preserve that? How do you roll back data that's in a different structure? Um, so these all become key questions, and um, it it takes experience. It takes it, 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 there. So it, it's it's actually quite complex. It's more than just let's modularize that because actually developers already understand this in code. They understand the principle principle of modularization, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, making things in small deployable modules, um, but they don't necessarily understand the consequences or the wraparound. So. As an example, we as you might have a, a, a geo data a geo placement of data capability. And that means that you can tie data to a specific location. So for GDPR compliance, you can say, I want this data in France and this data in the UK and this data in the US. If you make a change and change the parameters on the underlying storage so those locations are not defined, suddenly that data will move to the places where you've said it. So it could move from the UK to France. Suddenly, you haven't got a technical problem. You've got a compliance problem. Having the understanding and the knowledge, you, you know, the DBA is, it, it's easy to automate the infrastructure, some of the messaging, but having the DBA provide that consultative nature about the impact of these things and what, you know, what's the cost of changing it, what's the cost of rolling it back, What's the compliance nature of this one? How data is tokenized? Another critical feature in data governance these days. These combinations all come together. And actually, it's a, it's a growing and different skill, skill set. And I think we'll see people who have DBA skills and people who have governance skills coming together. The roles will be closer than they've been. To govern, data governance is for too long sat outside looking in, throwing rocks. You, know, you should do it like this, but nobody does it. Um, now, now with DevOps driving the changes in the database, the DBA and the data governance person become much more closely aligned and work together with these things. And it's a more proactive role. It's a more pre, it's it's not kind of waiting for the, uh, you know, the release to be thrown over the wall and then throwing it back. It's a matter of being the other side of the wall and consulting in making yeah. sure that when we get to deliver a delivery point, it is going to be, uh, and that, and that's characteristic of agile. I think what yeah. what, we're, what we're seeing is you, you, agile evolves and it becomes a way of working for a group of people. But actually, it doesn't take the whole the whole everything with it. It didn't take systems engineers. It didn't take DPAs. It didn't take everybody else. But it just became a way. That, as Olivier said, you develop stateless code. And it was really good, really efficient at that, but there was some stuff that they didn't get to. What we're now looking at is actually all of those things, network engineering, DBAs, systems engineers, all those other skills around it are still needed. And I've seen many structures in organizations. I, I, I set up a um, safe agile team in one organization I was working for previously. And they had special groups for the DBAs, which were outside the work, agile team. That's going to go. Those people are going to come into the team and they're going to be active participants who are going to be in the design meeting saying, when you do this, this is the things you need to think about. And then they're going to help 
to the management and the, the um, consultancy and the deployment about these things as it goes through the process. Because Agile is about bringing the people together and it's about bringing the skill, the, a group of skills. And one of those skills will need to be DBA, yeah, another one will be networking and so on. Yeah, you, you, again, I'm going to pick, I'm picking up on the body language here, um, Olivier. So you were nodding when David was talking about introducing database skilled people into the engineering teams, not just for, oh, I know how, a, uh, how to do DDL, but for things like governance and, and, and other compliance dimensions. Uh, yeah, uh, if I take... My own experience, the way we do it uh, currently in Comply Advantage, but also the way I used to do it also in the past. And if I compare the journey, I think before, you know, just like before we used to have sysadmins and now we don't really have anyone. You know, we split that role into two types of capabilities. You've got the SIs and, and you've got the proper DevOps uh, and they don't do the same thing anymore. DBAs to me is exactly the same thing. And if I look at how we work today uh, in my company, especially where we have strong data issues in terms of governance, um, we split the role as well. And so you, you've got uh, the pure infrastructure maintenance and administration, just keep it up and running kind of that moved in the SI world, everything else in terms of data modeling, data architecture, data flow, data streaming, all of this moved back into the development world. Um, and to David's point, this is an architecture role. Um, so uh, these guys, they sit with the team, writing the code with the team, they design the diagrams with the team. They are there to make sure that the big picture is there always and that we know when we do a change, what happens to a function, to a data store, and how we move forward. Um, and that is, you know, to me, that's really the way to go. Um, uh, DBA is kind of um, the old nomenclature. Uh, and now it's really, uh, everyone is writing code, you know, uh, you can even write your diagrams as code these days. So uh, everyone does it. That's the... That's how you can roll back also easily, because you can uh, put a lot of gates as you ship these changes, um, and it becomes predictable. Now, there's a, somebody just asked a question. One of the participants on the on the webinar, which about a specific product, data ops product called Liquibase, uh, and saying, well, you know, isn't it just a matter of <clears throat> good practice with with existing software? Yeah, um, and I want to throw that back at you guys because the way I'm hearing it from you is it, that really best practice is not established, not well understood, it's not well established. And that seems to me in those circumstances, jumping to solution is can sometimes be a bit premature. Frank, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, for sure, liquid buys is the solution. I. I've seen people doing homemade comparison of schemas, but yeah, but better use a tool. Uh, but but then you need a process. So the the tool is good, the tool is there, and if people do it correctly, that's fine. But uh, yeah, in the question, it's is it just enough? It's not enough in the sense where there is an effort. And also, you mentioned the the fact that we can hold back. That also means that sometimes we have to do two changes for only one. For example, you want to change the data type of a column. Maybe you will not change the data type for the wall table during a release. Maybe you will add a new colon and change your code to update both colon and in, in, in a future release, remove the old one. So it's more effort for, for on the data, but maybe also on the application to be able to to stay in sync with with the database schema. So mm -hmm. yeah, there are tools, but the, 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 the tools are just there to help. Uh, liquid base. The, the nice thing is that you 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 can have your schema changes, the the, the incremental changes on the schemas. Uh, that you can version in GitHub or that, but you still have to write them. Huh? There are no tools where you will just 
compared to schema generated by the application, for example, and know exactly I can run that on production and it will move from version uh, uh, two to version three. So, right. So, a couple of things you, you're saying there is, um, yeah, you need to have good tools, but you, in order to use those tools effectively, the more what's more important is the process. And that's what you've all been talking about the sort of the higher level process. I mean, that's what I'm taking away from this. Yeah. Uh, this, also, this, I, I, this I mentioned that because I, I've seen people, people who didn't use liquid base and just have seen some PowerPoints about it. They think it will do everything. You still write SQL. You still write the DDL that will move from one schema to another one. Even if there are some tools that can help to compare the schemas, uh, you don't want to run on production on large tables, something that will alter your table that you have not written and tested yourself, probably. I think it's really important uh, it, it, because there's actually more coming in at the top into the process. Uh, yeah, I touched on governance and compliance, but the, the process that we always go through, and this is true across the board with these things, is tools are a solution to part of the process, but not an end in themselves. So every, you automate something that takes away that problem and it exposes the next problem down. So yeah, great. You've got the schema managed by liquid base, great, good product. Now what you want to do is manage data placement, all the rules about those sorts of things. And that's not going to be managed by liquid base. There is going to be, um, the, there's going to be another layer and another tool which does that. And then you have to consolidate tools and look at the processes which interlink link these things. And so, also you need to, to test it yeah, because yeah. you mentioned governance and then you probably don't want your production data in test environments just to test the, those uh, schema changes. But does it make sense to test it on, on data that is different or anonymized? Or, or, or yeah, that, That's also a problem. You, you need to test it and uh, automate the testing of it to... to uh, to, to be able to release it and deploy it in, in production without fear. Uh, but then you need a test environment that really looks like production, but that cannot be production. Well, this is where uh, your uh, pipeline is really important because what you need is to be able to uh, spawn testing environment quickly, destroy them quickly in a very cost-effective manner, because also, let's be realistic, there is a, a cost I mentioned there. Uh, you can't have your a clone, a snapshot of your production data, even if it's properly redacted, hanging around. It's just costly. So um, you need to be able to take a snapshot of what you want, sanitize it on the fly, uh, and then uh, create quickly a testing environment, uh, run your test there, and then destroy the environment. And that should be part of your delivery pipeline. So, you know, just like we have dedicated uh, CD pipelines for the, the way you host your code, whether it's on Kubernetes or on bare bone metal running old fashioned code, um, there is the same thing for, uh, for data. You need a dedicated pipeline to ship, to test, and also to monitor. Um, and, part, and part of that is isolation. It's by having microservices which have smaller, smaller groups of tables instead of having a, I, I'm dealing with somebody who has a 67,000 table schema. I mean, this is huge. You do not want to do change management on 67,000 tables. Um, so yeah, if you have microservices and you've got five or 10 tables, then you're, yeah, it's more manageable to take a, a snapshot and sanitize it as Olivia was describing. Um, that uh, uh, because it's small, it's smaller, even if it's big. I mean, one of the questions we've seen in the um, in, in the chat at the moment is asking, what, how do you do this with Oracle with a three to five terabytes of data table? It's difficult. The reason new databases are coming around and new processes, I mean, Frank touched on one of these, you know, add a column, dual write to the two columns, eventually move, move the other column out. But you know, the, the way of building an Oracle database, spinning it up quickly, bringing data into that in a large schema in a monolithic application is huge. It's, there isn't an answer to this. 
there's not an easy answer to this. There's always an uh, answer. Yeah, and, and the question is about rolling back. Then if you have downtime, you need, if you have downtime to for your release, then you need to take in account the possibility to roll back. Yeah. If you do not do that online, then you, you can flash back in Oracle or we all, uh, we have also uh, uh, snapshots in uh, in Yugabat. But there are things that you want to deploy online. And yeah. there are some DDLs that are online, but then rolling back is not easy because if it's online, then you want to roll back your changes, but not what the other have done. And all of this feeds into exactly why I started the conversation about being consultative and everything else. In order to put those there, there is no silver bullet that solves all the problem. So you need the process. And in order to have the process, you have to have people who can advise you about the risk and things. So this is, and it becomes a risk management exercise. If we do this, we need to test it heavily before we deploy it because it's destructive and we may not be able to go back. Or if we do this, it's a lightweight change and we've got an easy way to roll forward. And those are the things that DBAs do today which makes them feel like they're blocking the process. But what we need to do is get their advice early in the process so that we, we can automate it and understand which thing we can assign value. This is worth spending more time doing on it. This is worth, this is a small change and the impact is small with it. Well, to your point around microservices, it's all about the blast radius really. Um, mm. And so if you have a small, area that you cover with a change then the risk of doing that change is limited and uh, the easiness of testing it is limited uh, is maximized and so uh, this is what is key and then you know uh, you have also various data layers for various data needs and so um, uh, it's you're not going to have the same complexity if whether you use a, a structured SQL type of DB or a no SQL type of DB or uh, Kafka even as a source of truth. It's um, you're not going to have the same process and, the, and they all have their complexities and, uh, and advantages. So um, in a microservice world, and this is, I think, the core of my point, you can tailor for each part of your business logic uh, the exact precise tool you need for your data needs. And then therefore you can really make it at pace. You can test it easily um, because back in the days when you had uh, your 7,000 tables, maybe some of them could have been handled in a different fashion. Yes. I think that's one of the problems. I mean, reading some of the questions, we will try and address them as we go through, but reading some of the questions. Oh, yes. It reflects where we are all in in this path but perhaps preempting one of your questions Di. but yeah people have different places on the journey those organizations which have got to microservices that have moved to agile and things are starting to address these problems and there are tools in other products which let you do flashbacks and all these things but the, the expensive tools and the expensive infrastructures which are bespoke and they they need a different type of discipline and yeah, the trend uh, uh, that we all see in value is the accelerated business value delivery, which comes from microservices and agile. And underpinning that, you need you know, databases which are going to give you infrastructure as co or you know, databases as a service type things, but deployable to Olivier's point quickly to build up a, a sandbox or whatever you need to do this testing, have snapshots in it. All of these features become what you need from your modern data layer. And in those modern data layers, you're going to have, uh, as Olivier has already described, two or three different things. You're going to have an analytical database, a transactional database like you provide, a streaming tool like Kafka or you know, streams, depending on which cloud provider. These are, these are the important components. These are the building blocks. And that DBA, that data specialist, is going to, say, help you understand what are the best use cases for these things but the developer then is going to make the ultimate choice of what meets his need and runs through that parallel development next. but i mean what what you're you're, you're saying is basically <clears throat> you know it's like how do i solve this problem uh, to which the answer is well 
you shouldn't have got yourself in the position where you had this problem. If you thought about the that's everybody has it. That, that's unfair. That, I bet you don't deliver. You, you, I know. I know you too well. Everybody has this problem because everybody has been developing stuff for a long time. Uh, and it's not their fault that they're in the problem. We all did best practice. And we all did it in this way for many years for good reasons, because it was best practice at the time. But then now you're in, we have an and opportunity that, to update best practice. And I think this is the big thing. The change to Agile is the biggest single change that, 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 that's happening in these things. It forces you, change to microservices and Agile forces you to think about how you're building these systems. It's not a lift and shift. It forces you to make the change. And when you make that change, you're going to change everything. You're going to change the type of database you're going to do. You're going to change the type of tools you use to deploy. You're going to build pipelines, all of these things. And now is the time, is the opportunity. Some organizations who haven't got there yet look at this as the threat, the cost of moving to Oh, it's going to be a big deal. But actually, it's the opportunity. This is the time to have the opportunity to move uh, to move to reskill. It's a great opportunity for organisations because it reduces. You mean costs. You, you, you're suggesting that even if an organisation's kind of their roadmap is to start breaking up monolithic apps into microservices, but keep the same database back end, uh, and then maybe start breaking chunks off the database and moving those to more data layer more modern data layer what you're suggesting is they need to that roadmap needs to have thought through the data layer even though you know everybody who does it you 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 kind of you start modernizing apps long before you start modernizing databases typically. But you're saying, yeah, you may not actually change databases, but you really need to be thinking about the characteristics that those databases will need to have and the processes, the data processes that you're going to need to put in place as soon as you can, because those are going to affect other decisions you do make now. Is that fair? Yeah. Brief, I, brief I, and at the end of the day, the data is, I mean, we're, we're all becoming, you know, it's a cliche, but we're all becoming data-driven businesses. And the data is this massive asset that we sit around with. So we are custodians of it. And to, you know, to not plan what you're going to do. I mean, it doesn't that all happen in one go. It's not a big bang. But if you're not planning what you're going to do, then you're not being responsible with that asset. How are you going to manage it, maintain it as you move around? How are you going to accelerate your deployment and your development and at the same time retain and value that data is a, it's a really key driver in all of these things olivier i'm going to put you on the spot here with a bit which is you know do you do you recognize what david's talking about this this need to kind of big picture thinking right from the beginning and do you do that on your practice <laughs> well yeah that's a mean question for us uh, <laughs> So yeah, I do recognize it. Um, you know, I, I I think at the end of the day, um, it has nothing new. As you know, uh, it's just that now we are applying what the good practices we've developed on some other places. Um, but it's exactly the same. You know, uh, if I give you a, a different case outside of data, when you design a software, you think about the pot potential extension. You don't necessarily do them now, but you leave yourself in a good place where you can add these extensions later on, um, where you can change the behavior of the software. Um, the way you design your data and your data strategy and your data stores and your pipeline, all of these, it's exactly the same. Uh, you don't know what you don't know, uh, but you have to uh, give room for that uncertainty. And so, um, here uh, in Comply, when we design software, that's exactly what we do. We uh, we design the data on the needs that we have right now. Uh, we shape it, we tailor it uh, uh, to fit that description. But we're also aware that it will change. And so uh, we infuse that awareness in everything we do in the way we should uh, the the database changes uh, it needs to be small uh, observable uh, easily rolled over 
And so back to what Frank was saying around sometimes you create a new column instead of updating one. Um, you know, uh, so we do this everywhere, uh, and but we try also to limit the quantity of data that we have to make it manageable. Um, and we are not perfect. Sometimes we make mistakes uh, because we make the wrong call, and we uh, and actually we realize too late that it was a mistake. It's always the same with mistakes, you know. Only uh, only when it's too late, sadly. But you know, and so then you have to shout it and and go back to the drawing board, and and that's okay. You know, that's how engineering works. But um, yeah. Uh, the practices are the same to me, whether you write uh, code or you write data, you use the same practices and um, and it's really about testing and uh, observability at the end of the day. Okay, I'm going to go, Frank, right back to where you started, um, I think, because what Olivier is just saying here is, you know, you we need the same practices in data ops as uh, developers are using in, in agile delivery, but the the kind of you know, agile delivery in in software engineering has been going fifteen years or more, really. But recognizable agile practices, and I don't remember those equivalent practices de um, developing in data ops. You know, anything like are we going to are we going to be are we fifteen years behind on the data side? I think it's also because of the team. What Olivier mentioned is that the we need a kind of DBA on application side, and, and that existed also. The the whole of application DBA is something that I've seen in some companies. The the big problem when the operation department cannot be agile, the operations just rent to 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 have the uh, everything that works reliable. Really and then they don't want any change. So <laughs> if you want to have new releases, you need to change to, to another team. You, 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 you need a manager that wants to push new releases, not a manager who just wants people to touch nothing ju just to keep it working. So now you're, now you're talking about changing human behavior. I, 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 I actually, I, it's interesting when I often talk about um, there are two types of things. There's implementers and they're, they're um, maintenance mode people. And um, implementers are always up for change regardless of the role that they're doing. And um, the maintenance of the, the feet of water and people are always at risk adverse. It, and it's very much personalities. And I know I'm, that I've... Got... I'm going to take issue with your classifying as the implementers who sound like people, oh, they're doing stuff. And the maintenance... Well, I'm one of them. So, uh, uh, Always sounds like you know there's there's something kind of derogatory in that term. How about the operations people who operate the business? Would that do, David? <laughs> uh, uh, no, no. So there, <laughs> there are people. Who, so there, there are two parts of the cycle. There, there's all, uh, and it depends on how dynamic you are. So someone like Comply Advantage is a very dynamic organization. They are always implementing. They're always looking for the next feature and be fast. There are other organizations who are quite ha happy to develop something which gets to a point and then feed and water it behind those that uh, just feed and water fair, it. Fair enough. I, yeah, I, I think I misinterpreted you. I, what I meant was that when one of, the, one of those many incremental innovations makes it, yeah. it, is oper it becomes part of the operation. Well, everything that, that, everything that, becomes operational, absolutely. But, yeah. um, but, there, but there's a nature in organizations and i think yeah you know, we've talked about this so much but the internet and everything else changes and, and you know cloud and zoom and everything else changes all of these things but you know for a long long time and olivia used to use the word at the start people were frightened of making change i've got this working i've got it static i know that i can do it in a dr test don't touch anything because i don't know what the plug's going to do um what What's happening though is everything, you know, change, changes are given, everything is going to change all the time, and you have to change for, to survive. I mean, you know, the business case is again, we comply with what they do. That you know, the regulatory regimes that they support 
for organizations change all the time. The ideas of what these things are and what they're doing change all the time. They can't control that it's external factors. So they have to innovate and they have to meet market demand. And because they're doing that, they have to, and this is why I love talking with Olivier, although we disagree on rugby, we agree on a lot of other things. And um, all of these things have to feed back. And it's going to feed back into all the teams. It's going to feed back into improvements in DevOps. It's going to feed back into DBAs and how they work in the organization. Uh, but it is about accepting change as a norm rather than um, doing it. And therefore, and it goes back to the tool point as well with liquid base. You start, you, you get tools to automate the mundane and so that you can handle more change. All of this is interrelated in terms of these things. But is there another part of it, which is something that Olivier referred to very early on, which is about the fear factor, the cost of getting it wrong in production means that the people who are the custodians of the operations, they, you know, they feel that responsibility it is, is not part of the way ahead, not re-engineering human nature, not classifying the tribes differently, but is it part of you know, raising confidence amongst operational people. You said it, David, about, you know, tools, good tooling, yep. yeah, uh, and automation. Is, is this maybe this should be a focus here on what can be done to lower the fear factor, if you like, legitimately lower the fear factor. So actually it is less fearsome, it is less risky, you know, focus yep. on, on processing and tools there, as well as people, you know, and their skills yeah, and such. That, that, that's what what gets, yeah, that's where it gets interesting because we've talked a lot about tooling and about what you do and how you approach. If you build up the sorts of processes where, which we've discussed, add and take away a column rather than just replacing it in, in situ and things like that, then the risk drops because you you put you, you design the, you, your DBA as a consultant helps you design processes which reduce risk. As the risk drops, the fear factor drops because you have more and more success. So all of these, yeah, we're all frightened of big, big schemas and big changes because we're going to change 6,000 objects tonight and we've got a three-hour downtime window to do it. And go! Yeah, I'm terrified, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, but that comes back to what you were saying about the consultative approach. And that's something, Frank, you referred to, this idea that, well, actually, if, if you know, that... We keep, we keep grabbing your example, your excellent example, Frank, of rather than changing a column, add a new column, then update the software to start using the new column. Then you, when it's all done, then you can remove the old column. And that actually is a number of incremental mini releases, some of which don't deliver any business value, but they do make sure. Yeah, that that's the point. It doesn't deliver any business value. So someone has also to, to do the marketing stuff. Why we do that? We do that to reduce the technical depth, for example. Also, Olivier, Olivier mentioned that we probably start to shard big databases too late. Uh, ju just because if, if you do it early, nobody will see it. I mean, the, the things that you do on the database, if you make a mistake, everybody will see it. If you do something really nice for the future, nobody will see it. That's different from the application where you release a new feature everybody will see it and if it doesn't work well they, they will wait, wait the next release so That's someone has also to, to to the marketing of it we we did that even we stopped the application this weekend uh, but we did that to 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 be able to scale in the next years but even I if you don't say it in the front end uh, your marketing bit i think is the responsibility of the leader uh, yeah. the leadership in the technology department of a company, that's their job to do that marketing and to make sure that people understand what's going on under the hood, you know. Um, uh, otherwise, they, they don't have many more purposes than this one, uh, bringing the spotlight where it deserves to be and educating the others who don't really understand the complexity of the job. Um, so, yeah. Oh. And trashing a database to be appreciated is not a good career move, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, I mean, uh, there was a company, if I remember correctly, 10 years ago, who, uh, who crashed their production DB um, and died from it. Uh, and they were doing very well before. Um, so, yeah. Um, 
it's a really bad move. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can. I can't remember the, who the companies were. That I remember the story of a a major merger or acquisition which was actually backed out because of the incompatibility of databases in the end there was no way that they could make these these interoperate or migrate one to the other yeah but it it does sound um oh thank you david you're taking that question to you um, uh, it does it, it sounds to me like you're all kind of optimistic and hopeful and and you know from a yugabyte point of view it's we're a database company. It's in our, you know, it's in our interest that the databases and data are are handled optimally by our customers because, in some senses, if they if they fail, we fail. Um, so so you know we're highly motivated to do that. But you know, leaving that aside, you all of you appear to be optimistic that the gains that have been made in engineering through agile best practices can be analogously learned and applied in database not exactly the same because of things like you know it's not as incremental the risk factors are different but you, but you all seem to think that that is the direction of travel and that is an appropriate direction of travel i'm going to frank because do you see that in a different levels of maturity in organizations you work with I, I think we see it with new applications, the legacy applications, database, the monoliths that that are running in the banks for for the last twenty years. They they will probably not change the way they they do it, but because applications started DevOps and then new application try to do the same with the, with the database. Yeah, and Olivia, you, you, you know, saying. I'm sure that any organization you've been in the leadership team for is uh, is much more advanced along the curve than the, the some of the so pick the uh, the rear guard only uh, uh, Frank's describing. Well, you would be surprised. Uh, <laughs> it's not always an easy journey, uh, even for new companies. For sure, banks. I mean, they are well known for the the, the weight of their legacy systems and the fear of everyone touching it. I, I remember yeah. one of my friends whose mom was called from out of retirement because she was the only couple engineer they could find to solve a problem. So, um, yeah, uh, there are maybe a special case, but uh, every single company that is running software out there, at some point they have a data store that went out of hand. They have their legacy applications that are, are never updated because, oh, God forbid, it works. And so, you know, we're all guilty of it. At some point, you over, always overlook what is working until it doesn't, and then you realize it's too late. So um, you always have a skeleton in a closet somewhere. Um, and, you know, I think uh, my experience on this kind of stuff is that the, the easiest way to tackle this kind of uh, problem is to flip the table um, and to just agree that that stuff is not manageable anymore and it needs to be redone from the ground up. Um, uh, and unless you agree, then you're going to struggle for months or years. The, right. the databases have also evolved with uh, with change data capture to, to be able to, to stream the changes to other databases because it's not possible to break a big monolith but you can start to move some microservices to smaller databases and then we've we've changed data capture which which is available today was not the case 10 years ago so so, so you you then you you know like you've got this the monolith which is untouchable that, that olivier is describing and we and we've all seen those but what you're saying frank is well no you can nibble away at that and take well, yeah. responsibilities, and therefore it's the fear factor associated with it. Olivier? You slice and dice, you reduce the fear factor, and back to what David was saying around JSON, uh, and you know, if uh, that ties up to what Frank is saying around uh, the changes in data models. Um, you revisit the, the same problem 10 years later, you have better solutions, better tools. And so you, but uh, you, you divide and conquer, so you isolate, anatomic kind of components that you can redo in isolation 
and then you go from there and, and there and there and suddenly your five terabytes database becomes uh, non-existent anymore because you've migrated several yeah. times um, and then you're sorted but it takes uh, mm -hmm. good design and uh, quite a lot of will right and so, and so then your your new environment is then intrinsically more manageable less fear factor is involved in change yeah. to to go back to that point about you know more knowledge more design is applied up front to make the data more flexible yeah yeah and david the, if i can come back to you because i know you know what olivier was talking about the and 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 frank as well about this incremental nibbling away at the monolith we we've got in Yugabai, at least a couple of big customers who made that very explicit, didn't they? About what cannot be touched, what can be, what must be rewritten, what can be hived up. They, do you comment yeah. about that? So yeah, so I think people are looking for a lot of reasons to move away from some of the big vendors, and what we're seeing now are people with ten years plans, which are sort of saying, right, this one's going to will. Um, fade away, you know, as we replace it with other functionality, it's going to go away. This one, we need an active program to write, create it. This one, we're going to build from scratch because we want to take a different approach to the information. And we've seen some really sophisticated plans which have a vision. Yeah, I'd love to know the companies, but these plans are so complex and commercially sensitive, it's difficult. But what we are seeing is people looking at a 10-year plan which is yeah and these this yeah i'm thinking in particular of one huge american banking organization which has a 10-year plan to remove a major relational database historically which is going to um focus focus on building the right technologies and new data layers is really is adjusting its teams to take advantage of that hiring new people to do these sorts of things putting those whole processes through so yeah, uh, and as you said, um, yeah, there's retain, there's nurture, uh, and there's yeah, remove from the organisation these sorts of things. And I think building out and understanding how you're going to do this and where the cost benefits are of doing each of these ones, and then choosing the right things for the uh, and the right skills for the DevOps teams and DBAs is absolutely core. And that's again a consultative path. What can we do with this? What can we do? What can the DBA do to help us understand? what we've got and what, what the cost of operating it is. Okay, I think we're kind of running up to the top of the hour. So if I can just take a moment to summarize what I think I've learned today and then uh, give you each the opportunity for some closing remarks. I I kind of, I think number one is your set is that the lessons that that we've learned in and in software engineering in the last, you know, decade, two decades, of, of our development of agile processes, we need to apply this all the way through to the data processes as well. Uh, and, and by the way, that best practice is not yet established for doing that. Some organizations are barely kind of wouldn't even necessarily accept that as being a truth, but you guys all all you know hold your hand up as the credo is we need to learn those lessons. Uh, and number two is that one of the ways to do to reduce the fear factor look well, i'll come back to another fact well, one of the ways to reduce the fear factor is to make sure that engineering software engineering are building stuff that is less fearful for the dbas to take into operations and that means the consultative data expert dba in agile engineering teams and olivia this is something i think you regard as a kind of a, an established best practice, at least for you. But that's again something that is not industry wide. But that's a, but that's a second lesson: is bring the skills into engineering, so you don't try and do dangerous things because you recognize them and found a less dangerous way to do it. Uh, and then the third lesson, I think, is this thing about you've got the monolith; you don't change it for very good reasons. So how do you deal with that? And the the is kind of is that nibbling away the incremental lowering of the dependency on the monolith 
and, and you know, David, you, you talked about a ten-year plan you were talking about in that bank yep. in the US. Yeah, and so we, so we, what you know, those, those are my my three lessons about there is apply the lessons, bring the expertise in house, and don't think you're going to fix this all tomorrow. No matter how smart you are, it is going to take days, months, and years of careful planning and sensible execution to do that. Um, we're pretty much top of the hour. Anybody have anything think that we that you know we really haven't brought out that needs to be brought out at this stage? I think Maybe just something. Also, it's good to put pressure to database vendors because what was not possible before is possible now because people ask for it. A few years ago, it was impossible to do a thin clone of a database, for example. It was impossible to, to do many uh, changes uh, online. And do not give up. Just It's difficult, but ask also the database vendor to, to, to provide those, uh, those tools. Part of that dependency on better processes and better skills and better tooling, then, well, hey, the database vendors, you know, I, I characterized it as, oh, we, the Yugabyte database, we sit in the middle and these things go on around us. And you're saying, no, 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 you have to participate. You have to make these operations easier. The database vendors have to play a part as well. I think, David, but, there was a question about that. Which I think you've answered. Yeah, I, I've answered, but I do want to make a point. There, there are two parts to what we do at Yugabyte. I mean, yeah, we're delighted to have Olivier with us as a customer today as well. But, yeah. Frank's role in the organization as a developer advocate, you can talk to him just on the abstract, but also in my team in Europe, we have people who've done this. I mean, I used to run the enterprise data platforms in a major bank. Come and talk to us. We want to hear what these challenges are because we want to improve the tools. We want to listen to what these things are. And yeah, within, within constraints, we're also interested in yeah, talking to you about how we fit into those models. So Take advantage of the developer advocates, find Frank on LinkedIn, find him on Twitter, Mastodon, 40 other places to use these days. Talk to us, uh, talk, you know, reach out to my team in, the, in EMEA and to the equivalent teams in the US, because we want to learn too. Um, what you're doing and the challenges you face are the things which will form our product and help us make the best database going. Yeah, that's great, all right. Thank you, gentlemen. I thought it was a good chat today. I learned a lot. Uh, thank you once again. Thank you, all of our participants, and uh, see you all next time.